Please help me welcome uh, Joel Harry. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it sure is fun to dump on the UN, isn't it? Isn't it fun? I uh, was speaking with a full colonel the other day down in Calgary. Blue boy bullshit. What we need are at war fighters to go in there, kick ass, and take names. And that was a rather telling comment from a guy with four? Four rings? Yeah, four rings. Rather telling. So what I wanted to do today was try to realign that kind of conversation. And Alex was very kind enough to give me a topic called Analyze Systematic Management Within the DND. And if that doesn't put you to sleep, I don't know what will. So what I did is I took the liberty of rephrasing the question into something that I liked, which was, let's assess the elements of, US, of UN peace operations that impact the DND and its governance. In other words, look at the whole thing 180 degrees. So we reverse the perspective and look at the DND from outside the DND, not from within. And this might resonate with some of you who have had operational planning process experience, the OPP. It's the famous planning paradigm within the UN. But we've had 10 years or so of war fighting OPP. And I was privileged to do a little bit of an Op Apollo in 2001. And I was later privileged to do it in UN operations in Sudan. And I would put it to you that war fighting OPP is not necessarily the same as non war fighting. OPP. Same templates, same PowerPoint slides, same three options, left, right, up the middle. It, those things don't change. But a frame of mind does change. And the frame of mind may go back to something that my good friend T.E. Lawrence told me. You may recall Lawrence of Arabia. I was having lunch with him the other day, and he said, Joe, armies win wars, but they don't end them. So if we go back to what Norm Leitz said, we don't want another Hitler, words to that effect, you got to ask yourself, well, what is the end state of this? Armies win wars, but they don't end them. So then I think back to what Lori Hahn said, and that there is a diplomatic and a military balance. And who's the leader? And maybe that's the first question you should not ask. Because if you ask who's a leader, then there's a follower. Then there's a food chain. Then there's hierarchy. Then there are going to be spitting contests over real estate. And all of a sudden, you don't need to go to Africa to have a fight. You got one in Ottawa. So I think we have to be very, very careful how we even approach this thing. My good other good friend, who's also dead, William Sapphire, he, uh, op-ed uh, writer with the New York Times, he said, in the land of diplomacy, context is king. And if you have a problem and you can't solve it, make the problem bigger. So that's what I've tried to do in the next 18 slides. By the way, the number on the bottom right-hand corner, you guys can see it, pardon me. That's, uh, those are slide numbers. I got 19 slides so you can measure progress by how far we go. So in the next 20 or so minutes, we're going to have to face some limitations. We don't know everything. As, as uh, Lori said it very well, we don't know the full policy goals. We only know some of them. Plus the fact the policy goals may be evolving. So there's no fixed, there's no fixed set of policy goals. They're a, flu they're a fluid product. But whatever they are, the operational planning process is going to have to start with an assessment of national values and essential interests. And a very good friend of ours, uh, Ignatieff, who when he was teaching at Harvard uh, in 2004, went up to Ottawa to deliver the O.D. Skelton Lecture. And great lecture, by the way, you can Google it. But he made the distinction between national values and essential interests. And you've got to start with national values. And he said uh, one such value might be something called peace, order, and good government. We all remember that from high school. But maybe our national values have changed a little bit. 
Now, I don't know if values change with government or, with not, or not. Perhaps they don't. But I'll throw something out at you and, and get you to think, do national values now include such things as human rights? Is that of an interest or is that a value? How about uh, sustainable development? Is that a Canadian value or a Canadian essential interest? I don't, I don't know. I'm not here to shape the conversation. I'm just here to throw that out. Essential interests, which also drive the operational planning process, albeit at the strategic level, are going to be uh, economic development and national security. But as has been alluded to by the panel, I think that there is a, an expiring body of knowledge in terms of UN peace operations. It's been replaced by resident knowledge in war fighting. But here we go again. If we start labeling it war fighting as opposed to US, UN peace ops, we're going to shape our minds in a too structured manner, and we may not be able to have mission success. The last limitation are the outputs of back-channel UN diplomacy. We're sitting here in the Ramada Inn today. We have no idea what's being discussed in New York, but I'm willing to bet you that something is. So let's look at the impacts on the effectiveness from five points of view. The very brief evolution of organizational mandate, and I'll tell you right now, I do have a bias in terms of international law, but I will try to stay away from that. But Forgive me if it, if it becomes too obvious. The second impact is measured by the Security Council relation, but the third one is the most interesting of all, to, I think, to all of us, and that is of the asymmetries in both the operational and legal paradigms. How do we govern this asymmetry between DFATE or government, what do they call it now? Global Affairs. Global Affairs and DND, and how do we measure the asymmetry between DPKO and other departments throughout the UN. And what about the asymmetry between troop contributing countries, which we'll get to in a sec. I'm getting ahead of myself. But those five items you just might want to keep in mind, and if, you'd, if you want me to flip back, more than happy to it. But the evolution of the organizational mandate, Norm Leach will know more of this than I, but the League of Nations had two narrow aims. It, was, it addressed only threats to peace, it was only there to settle disputes and to impose Shanks sanctions. That is not the mandate of the United Nations. That was one of some of the reasons the League of Nations failed. The League of Nations also failed because it had exclusive membership. You can't come in, but you can. You can't come in, but you can. That was a very exclusive membership. And it had too little political power. There was too much infighting. Global Affairs and DND. Again, a, a spinning contest within the confines of the organization. Lastly, the League of Nations required unanimity. All those in favor do so. And of course, somebody would say, no, I don't. So nothing happened. The UN, by comparison, has got an inclusive membership, 192, three, Call me a liar for one or two. 190 plus members, virtually every sovereign state on the planet. Secondly, the UN uh, Charter is the supreme treaty in the world. If there's a conflict between the UN Charter and any other treaty, NATO, uh, sorry, North Atlantic Charter, take your pick, the UN trumps it under Article 103. The UN has got and addresses an entire spectrum of diplomacies, as Security Council resolutions set out. And it is a majority, not a unanimity. Uh, within the Security Council, the five veto powers can veto, and that's it. Lastly, the UN is about collective security. It is not about collective defense. Huge difference. Collective defense, NATO. It is bound by treaty, and only those members who are mem only states who are members of that treaty are governed by it. But virtually the entire world is governed by the charter, hence a collective security. So if we move into Security Council resolutions, the, the Security Council resolution is a law. And this is, I just happen to have a copy of the most recent Security Council re resolution concerning Mali. 
what a coincidence. Dated uh, 825, uh, sorry, that's uh, 30 June of this year. And it mandates the mission to complete a series of operational tasks. So it, it, it doesn't micromanage, but it goes well beyond the broad uh, bring peace in our time. It actually specifies, by, and we'll see in a sec, by level of the spectrum of diplomacies, what's deliverable. So all these things should be going through your mind, whether you're a forest generator or whether you're a forest employer. Whether you're doing OPP in Ottawa or whether you're doing OPP in Wagudagu. So, I, I for, Liz, forgive me, you're sitting in the back, so it's your fault if you can't read. But what I wanted to do was give you an idea of some of the kinds of tasks that the mandate, that the Security Council resolution tells Nick Remshaw, here's what you have to do. So, I'm not insulting those in the front, but for those in the back who can't read, let me very briefly just slip down some of these. For example, in the, 20, in the uh, Resolution 2100, which really kick-started the Mali operation, stabilize key population centers. Nick, can you do that? Support implementation of transitional roadmap. Nick, are you up for that? Protect civilians and, civilians and UN per purse. Nick, that's right up your alley. Uh, promote and protect human rights. Well, that's great in a mandate, but how do you actually deliver that when you are in a camp in a particular African country, like Mali, and across the road, the UN has situated a refugee camp. And you would think that's brilliant. Here's the camp, here's the road, and here's the refugee camp. Got to be protection for anybody who's in the refugee camp. Everybody agree? Well, it ain't necessarily so. It depends who's occupying this camp. If it's Canada and there's a gang rape across the street, something will probably happen. But if it's another troop contributing country, it ain't necessarily so. So here we're starting to see some of the other level of asymmetries that occur in these kinds of operations. So Nick, how do you plan for this if you're back at a desk officer in Ottawa? Don't answer the question. But these are some of the gritty pro these are some of the gritty, gritty problems that will make the front page of the National Post, depending on who's in the refugee camp. And if Canada is only uh, 25 kilometers down the road, what kind of fallout comes from that? And we get onto legacy management, but we'll get onto that later. Um, support humanitarian assistance, support national and international justice. There is a certain individual called Joseph Coney, who, whose name some of you may recognize, wanted by the International Criminal Court, Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA. Uh, they know they. His, his whereabouts is known, but his apprehension will never occur, because he happens to share the same tribal blood as leaders in certain countries which who shall not be named. But those are the realities of the day. So Nick, you're driving down the road in your APC and you happen to see Joseph Coney walking by. What do you do? Shoot Don't him. answer. But you can't shoot him, because that's illegal. Well, uh, sir, actually, you know what? No, that's a good point. Here, another friction point. Do you shoot him or do you not? Well, it depends what country you're from. If you're from Canada, you respect the law of, armed, uh, law of international armed conflict. But maybe in some other countries, you don't. So again, more friction points for the planners. So we've, we've moved from what the Security Council provides to some of the asymmetries. So this is a outline of the Office of Peacekeeping Operations. And for those of you who know Dave Barr, Dave Barr was and may still be heading up Mission Planning Service. But the, uh, that is an outline of the DPKO. So pretty simple, just four, four branches. Can you see in the back? No? OK, well, let me, I, will, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but there are four elements. Office of Military Affairs, Operations, Rule of Law and Security, and Policy Evaluation. Pretty clear. 
Well, maybe not. Because all of a sudden now, this one Department of Peacekeeping Operations ends up with a whole hockey sock full of subsidiary services. Fourth generation, and we spoke about, well, is Canada, what is Canada going to deliver to the mission? Well, what does the mission planning service want? It's all very well and good for the government of Canada to say we will offer 600 peacekeepers or 600 personnel if these people do not want it. The fourth generation service is, if you will, beating the bushes looking for people to man the mission, but they're not always going to get whom they wish. There is a sample, again, I've, I'll read it for you from the back, but there is a sample of a mission structure. The previous one was, that's what's in New, that's what's in New York, that's what's in the field. So all of a sudden, you can start to see just how complex the mission structure is. Forget about the mission, forget about the mandate, just look at the structure. So for example, we have a special representative of the Secretary General with three deputies. Here's the force commander. Here's the army dude over on the right-hand side. But he seems dwarfed by a UN country team, World Food Program, UNICEF, Development Program, human rights, more human rights, food, sorry, health, food, I even forget who they are, Red Cross, and a whole number of implementing partners, NGOs. Nick, can you work with all these guys? Don't know. But let's see what the force commander's got. That's what the force commander's got. And there is Private Grimshaw. There is Private Grimshaw right down there. And there is Colonel Grimshaw right up there. So you, you look at the breadth of these missions and you say to yourself, it's going to be very, very difficult to accomplish mission success. Well, how do you define mission success? And one of it may be, if I come home safely, is force protection. But then what's the second element of mission success? So you came home safely, what else did you accomplish? So the operational planning process is difficult. You've seen maps before, and I apologize for those in the back, but just to give you an idea, huge countries surrounded by other African countries, most of whom you will, well, actually, what else would they be surrounded by? Huh? Um, but so most of these other countries, as you will see in the next little bit, are troop contributors, which brings up the next friction point. Another map of uh, Africa showing the, uh, the Yakim, that's the uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, uh, spread out throughout North Mali. But friction points, and we're talking, not going to talk about interoperability. How well does Canada work with troops from Bangladesh? There are about 24 countries here. I've highlighted the Netherlands, Germany, and Sweden as being countries with whom we've probably worked before and with whom we probably have interoperability. But Nick, when's the last time you worked with troops from Niger or Burkina Faso or Bangladesh. So there, as of today, there's about 8,600 troops here. When it started out, it was 5,000 back in July of 13. But it's crept up 5,071 or 9,800. So we have more friction points in terms of a planner and in terms of a operator. So if I were to sum up the asymmetries, there's <coughs> There's asymmetry in terms of interoperability at the operational, uh, the planning side, as well as the tactical. Protocols, drills, equipment, and culture. Do you protect the people who are being raped across the street from your camp or not? It's as much an interpretation of law as it is a cultural divide. Multinational command. The commander of Mali is, I believe, from Denmark or the Netherlands. But where's the deputy force commander from? He won't be from a NATO country. It seems that the protocol is that if the force commander is from a, I hate to use descriptors, but advanced or better trained country, his dep is from somewhere else and vice versa. So are you willing as a force generator in Ottawa to allow your troops to be commanded by somebody from Chad? 
for example. Don't know, and there's no editorial in my comment, but it's a question that you as planners have to not address. You have to answer it, yes or no, and under what, and under what conditions. And last, not lastly, but because uh, there's one more slide, interpretation of all of armed conflict. Each of us, or each country, and each culture will have different thresholds of tolerance. Do you tolerate rape as a tool of commerce? or not. It's a problem that popped up in Liberia a little while ago. Real gritty problems, and you have to try to anticipate them so that when they're on the ground, people can respond in a coherent and in a responsible manner. Asymmetries. Um, I've been talking about the military, but let's recognize, if you, if you flip back to this slide, remember all these are civilians. Remember, all these are civilians. You are not the only game in town. In fact, you're a very small game in town. There are a lot more civilians out there than there are you. So it comes back to, again, to what tasks can you fulfill within this broader civilian populated organization. Do you have to respect the neutrality? Sorry, Laurie, but you do have to respect neutrality and impartiality. Or at least you have to be seen to respect neutrality and impartiality. Whether you do it or not, different. But politics is perception, as you know better than I. Um, there was a great book, writ is a great book, writ uh, written by uh, Sarah Jane Meher called Helping Hands and Loaded Arms. It really sets out the spitting contest between the civilians and the military. And believe me, from personal experience, it's there. And there is a huge amount of acrimony between civilians and military. And you can understand why, because the problems were born out of warfare. They were born out of guys wearing uniforms of every description. But the solution lies, as, as T.E. Lawrence said, in diplomacy. So there's really another, there's what I've said here, a fight for battle space. They're fighting for either it's a humanitarian battle space or it's a military battle space. But is this an either or or can it be something in between? Um, I'm getting up to slide 17. We're almost done. I did want to put in a pitch for an organization called Sherbrig. It's a Standing High Readiness Brigade for UN Operations. It was born out of the Rwanda situation, as Lori, you probably know that. And it has since died, died in 2009, so had a shelf life of about 10 years. It did great work in Ethiopia, in Somalia, uh, sorry, in Sudan, and in Liberia. But an organization that was uh, stood up to act as a rapid reaction force, particularly in the planning side, but having planned it, countries were not obligated to contribute to it. So it was something of an ad hoc organization. And I think probably the, uh, the appetite for it waned after it had three successes in those three countries. Legacy management. We've spoken of Somalia, Rwanda, and Srebrenica. Um, this is not something you can plan for necessarily, but it's something you have to be mindful of because legacy management becomes the output of the previous 18 slides. Um, I'm not sure that I can say any more to that than that, but be careful what you start because what you end up with may end up in this slide, and that is not good. Of course, if you're successful, no one will remember, guaranteed. But if you, if you screw up, guaranteed, no one will forget. That's always the way it is. Lastly, um, and this is my own editorial, conclusions, recommendations. I think multilateral, multilateral efforts are a, a more cost-efficient way for Canada to protect its national values and advance its essential interests. And multilateralism is, to preach to the military in here, it is a center of gravity, a geostrategic. It's, at some level, it is a center of gravity. And I'll also suggest it's a national value. But my last comment is to recognize the efforts of Rousey, of EUSI, the Royal Commonwealth Society, and Edmonton Salutes for putting this on today.